We are going to begin chapter 11, entitled Gases. Okay. First, we'll start off with just uh, properties of gases. If we remember from the beginning of the semester in chapter 3, when we started to talk about the states of matter, and gases are one of the three states of matter. They are the least dense, most mobile state of matter. Remember that the volume and the shape are variable. Okay, remember, the, the, the gas particles are always in constant motion. Kinetic molecular theory, gas particles, molecules, are always in constant motion, kinetic, moving, okay, which allows for them to be, um, to have a variable shape and volume. So how can we measure something that is so mobile? Okay, pressure. Pressure is a force per unit area. And this is how gases are measured. There are various units for pressure. And in our calculations, we're going to focus on a few of them, but I just want to give you a comprehensive listing of multiple pressure units. Atmosphere is the SI unit, the metric unit for pressure. Uh, Torricelli, Tor, millimeters of mercury, MMHG. Um, mercury has the symbol HG from the... Uh, Latin name, hydrogerum. Um, mercury looks like, a, it has a nickname also, quicksilver, because it's liquid silver. It looks like silver water. Okay, so that's why you have the symbol for mercury. Pounds per square inch. If we look at the definition of pressure, force per unit area, pounds is a unit of force. It's a U.S. unit. It's not a metric unit. The metric unit for um, a force would be something like a Newton if you've had a physics class. But pounds per square inch. Inches squared is a unit for area. So pounds per square inch is a common pressure unit. Other pressure units, kilopascal, uh, the barometer bar. Okay. You may wonder how does a length, millimeters of mercury, uh, how that's used to measure pressure, which is a force per unit area. The pressure that a gas would apply to a column of mercury would allow for that column of mercury to expand within the glass column to the height that corresponds to the pressure applied on it by the gas. Um, if we were in um, on campus and in the laboratories, there are barometers in each lab at, um, at main campus and at the northeast campus, and it would give you the... Um, the pressure of the the lab by you would read the column of mercury the height of the mercury column and it's usually 755 millimeters of mercury okay um, but these are various units okay so we're going to start off by looking at these units and doing some conversions to go from one unit to the other you may be familiar with pounds per square inch for tire pressures you uh, you know you, you Check the tire pressure in your vehicle, right? And maybe you have one of these here, okay? You put the uh, valve stem, okay, uh, up to this, and the pressure of the tire, okay, the, um, it will come out and it will tell you what the, the tire pressure reading is, okay? One side is pounds per square inch, and then the other side would be kilopascals, which is used more frequently in, in Europe and Canada and Asia. And then the pounds per square inch is frequently used here in the United States. Um, okay. Um, so that's a, uh, something used to measure pressure. Uh, let me show you some other gauges here used to measure pressure. This here is a gauge that would go onto a gas cylinder. All right now, you could see that it's at zero because it's not hooked up to anything that's applying pressure to it. But if this were hooked up to, let's say, a helium cylinder, um, it would uh, the dial would move accordingly with the pressure that's applied to it. Okay, so this here has uh, pressure units in pounds per square inch and kilopascals as well. Okay, all right. Another device used to measure pressure, blood pressure cuff here, okay, all 
All right. And the gauge on the blood pressure cuff has pressure readings in millimeters of mercury. Okay, it's calibrated to um, give the readings for the blood pressure in that unit, okay? All right, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, blood pressure cuff in a, in a uh, future lecture and how that relates to one of the gas laws. Okay, let's do some conversions here with these different pressure units. At times it's necessary to convert from one pressure unit to another. And let's look at how those units are related to one another. And then let's do a couple of problems with the conversions. So let's look at equalities for pressure units. One atmosphere is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. Now the millimeters of mercury unit and the tour are exactly the same. Okay. One atmosphere is equivalent to 101.3 kilopascals and one ATM is equal to 14.7 uh, PSI, okay, or pounds per square inch. You may see it written either way. All right, let's look at these equalities and let's do a couple conversions from one pressure unit to another, okay? All right, so conversions. Let's say that we have a pressure reading of 755 millimeters of mercury. Okay, let's say that we're in the lab and we needed the pressure reading of the lab and we went over to the barometer that's located on the wall in the back of the lab and we recorded this pressure reading. But we need to convert it to units of atmospheres because we're gonna have to do a calculation later on that requires uh, pressure units in atmospheres. Okay, so let's convert millimeters of mercury to atmospheres. Okay, so we have the equality one atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury. We're going to use that equality and set that up as a conversion factor. Just like we learned in chapter two, just like we did with energy conversions, just like we did with the mole ratio. Okay, we'll use that dimensional analysis that given times desired over given format in order for us to get our answer, okay? So 755 millimeters of mercury is our given, okay? The equality right here is what we're going to use to set up our conversion factor. We want the answer in atmospheres. We want to convert out of millimeters of mercury, okay? So the like units cancel out. And we do the math, 755 divided by 760. Okay, if we follow three significant figures, 0.993 atmospheres. Okay, so that would be our equivalent unit millimeters of mercury into atmospheres. Okay. All right, let's do another conversion, okay? Let me split this board here. Example two, let's say that you have measured a pressure reading of 2.10 atmospheres, but let's say that you want it in something that, uh, let's say you want it in pounds per square inch. You need to communicate that pressure information and for some reason that unit needs to be in pounds per square inch for whoever is asking you for that reading. So let's convert this to pounds per square inch. Okay, again, let's choose the equality that relates the units. Okay. So we have one atmosphere on the bottom. That's our given unit that we want to cancel out. And 14.7 PSI. PSI is the unit that we want to convert into. So atmospheres cancels out. 
And then we have 2.10 times 14.7. So we have 30.9, with three significant figures, pounds per square inch. Okay, yes, you know when you do it on your calculator, you get this answer here, 30.87. Okay, but remember, we're dealing with measurements and significant figures. Okay, so to follow along with that, good practice, three significant figures. Okay. So the, uh, your automobile, the tire pressures in your automobile are typically around 30 PSI, 32, 35, 29, depending upon the specifications of your vehicle. But on average, 30, 35 PSI uh, for most automobiles. Trucks, it's a little higher. Uh, motorcycles, it's a little lower. So, um, but for most automobiles, it's in this, in this range here. Okay, so we need to convert a pressure unit from one unit to another, okay, we just use the equalities and set them up as conversion factors and just do our conversions, okay? But now we have pressure units instead of units for length and mass and energy, okay? Now we have a new set of uh, units here, but the math is the same, okay? So pressure is a way that we measure gases. But pressure is affected by different factors, such as the amount of gas, the moles of gas the volume of the gas, and the temperature. And to explain those uh, uh, correlations, we have gas laws. And in the subsequent lectures for Chapter 11, we're going to talk about several gas laws. We're going to talk about Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Gay-Lussac, Combined, and Ideal Gas Law. Okay, so each of the video lectures will go into um, detail with those particular gas laws. Okay, we're going to skip some of the sections in Chapter 11, and uh, you'll know which ones we're skipping because I will have that noted. Okay, the first gas law we're going to talk about is Boyle's Law. Okay, so section 11.2, Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law explains the relationship between the pressure and volume of a gas. Right, and it's named after the English scientist Robert Boyle, who did uh, experimentation, um, you know, with, with gases. Okay, so Boyle's Law, we have compared an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. Inverse. One goes up, the other goes down. Okay, so inverse relationship between pressure and volume. If we were to graph data for Boyle's Law, and we had an xy axis here, xy axis, sorry, okay, and we were plotting data for pressure and volume, okay, let's say we have pressure on the y-axis and volume on the x-axis, we would see a decreasing function, okay? It would never hit zero or go below zero because you still have gas particles, okay? We don't have negative amount of particles, and we don't have zero particles. Otherwise, then we don't have a gas that we're comparing pressure and volume parameters to. So we have a decreasing function, inverse relationship between pressure and volume. One increases, other decreases. Okay. The initial pressure and the initial volume, that product, is equal to the product of the final pressure times the final volume. So we have initial and final conditions that we compare. Okay, so this is initial and this is final. Okay. Let me give you an example of this gas law in practice here. Okay. I have a syringe here. Okay. Let's see if you can read the volume here. Okay. All right. So 
It's just a regular plastic syringe. I'm going to set the volume reading at 60 milliliters. Try to have it so you could see it. Uh, I think it's covered. It's 60 milliliters right there. I'm going to trap 60 milliliters of air in the syringe just as simply by placing my finger over the opening. Okay. Now, as I apply pressure, I'm going to increase the pressure by pressing on the plunger. I'm keeping my finger here the whole time. I'm going to increase the pressure and you're going to see as a result that the volume will decrease. Okay, I'm trying to keep it on the numbers there. All right, so I'm keeping my finger on it. You'll note I'm not taking my finger off it, but I'm increasing the pressure by pressing on it. Okay, see I'm pressing it and I'm not taking my finger off the opening. I'm increasing the pressure and what's happening to the volume? It's decreasing. All right, now I'm down to about 45 milliliters. I went from 60 to 45. I decreased the volume by increasing the pressure. Okay, inverse relationship. All right, I'm going to take my finger off now because it's making an imprint, okay? You get the idea, okay? Um, when you have pistons in an engine cylinder, okay, they're going through this similar uh, interaction here to allow for the combustion of gases, of the for the fuel to combust and for the gases to allow for the mechanical parts to move. So you have a Boyle's Law in action with the um, operation of pistons in an engine cylinder. When we breathe, okay, we inhale, we exhale. The lung volume increases when we inhale and the pressure decreases to allow the air in, right? When we exhale, the lung volume decreases and then the pressure increases to force air out. And we don't even realize that we're doing this because we're alive and we're breathing. And this happens, you know, so instantly, this application of Boyle's Law. Okay. Uh, the blood pressure cuff that I was referring to um, a few moments ago, he also works on the operation of Boyle's Law as well. Okay. So when you take blood pressure, you, you have this on the, the person's arm, you pump it up, okay, and then you have the stethoscope attached so you can hear um, the initial heartbeat and then when the heartbeat goes away, you open this valve, okay, to allow for hearing the, um, the heartbeat. But when the uh, cuff is inflated, the cuff restricts the blood flow, so you have a decreased volume of blood flow. And it gives you the higher reading, okay, when the heart is uh, pumping, okay? That's the systolic pressure. And then you open the valve here, okay, to let the blood go through, okay, and you have an increased flow, and that gives the lower pressure reading, okay, let's see, you have the, the two numbers there to, you know, make sure you're listening, and that will give the lower reading, which is the diastolic reading, okay, now I know you have digital uh, blood pressure cuffs and digital uh, pressure uh, devices as well, uh, but sometimes the analog was a little bit more direct because it bypasses getting a signal. And uh, sometimes you get a better reading with these analog devices um, for certain applications. Okay. So let's just put some examples here of Boyle's Law um, syringe applications. Pistons in engine cylinder. The mechanics of breathing. Okay, and over here, blood pressure cuff. Okay, so here's a problem that um, I was showing for Boyle's Law. I apologize, the video got cut off when I was writing it. Uh, so let me go through it in its entirety. What volume will 2.5 liters of gas occupy 
if the pressure is changed from 760 torr to 630 torr. Now it's a word problem. So if we look at the units, that gives us a lot of information. We have liters and we have torr, so we have volume and we have pressure, okay? So we wanna set up our equation, okay? Here's Boyle's Law, P1V1 equals P2V2. Let me just write it a little more centralized to line it up, okay? So our initial pressure, we have the initial pressure. We're starting at 760 torr from two. Start, go. Okay, so 760 is our initial pressure and the initial volume is 2.5 liters. What happens is that the pressure decreases. New pressure, P2, is 630 torr and the volume at that pressure, we don't know. We need to calculate that. So we see that the pressure is going down. Pressure is going down, the volume should be, go up because that's the relationship. So now we have this line here, okay? 760 torr times 2.5 liters equals 630 torr times V2. And then what we do is we divide both sides of the equation by 630 torr, okay, it's algebra. We wanna get the variable of V2 by itself. So 630 torr cancels out on the right-hand side, okay? And then on the left-hand side, units of torr cancel out. So then we have the math, 760 times 2.5 divided by 630 gives 3.0 liters, okay? So we round to two significant figures because all of our measurements of volume and pressure had two significant figures. So yes, your calculator will give you a non-terminating decimal, but we're gonna terminate it at two significant figures. All right, I wanna do another example. All right. This occupies a container of 205 milliliters, okay, at 0 0.750. ATM. If the gas volume was decreased to uh, 145 milliliters, what would the resultant pressure be? So we have, again, a word problem. And we have units, milliliters, atmospheres, milliliters. We have volume and pressure units. So let's write P1V1, P2V2, and let's look at what we have. Do we have the initial pressure? Yes, we're starting off at 0.750 atmosphere. And do we have the initial volume? Yes, we know that the gas in that container has a volume of 205 milliliters. Okay, we know now that the volume was decreased and we wanna know what the new pressure will be. So P2, we don't have, that's what we wanna find, that's our unknown. And V2, we do have 145 milliliters. So we're solving for the variable of P2. 
Okay, we want to take both sides now and divide by 145 milliliters. Okay, units of milliliters cancels out. So now we have math problem of 0.750 times 205 divide by 145. And the final pressure would be 1.06 atmospheres. Okay, that would be the final pressure. Okay, now does that make sense? Let's look. Let's just, what happened to the volume? The volume decreased. So if the volume decreases, then the pressure should increase. And it did. Went from 0 0.750 to 1.06. Okay, inverse relationship between pressure and volume for a gas. That is Boyle's Law.